back to the Neuroscience Corner. This is the third video in this series. In the last two videos, I've been looking at SSRI antidepressants. Today, I'd like to talk about allopregnanolone. And besides being a mouthful, it's playing a big role in antidepressant treatment, and especially with SSRIs. Early reports about 20 years ago now showed that SSRIs increased allopregnanolone levels, and that led to them being called by a certain subset of scientists selective brain stereogenic stimulants. <laughs> SBSSs. That's what they tried to rebrand SSRI antidepressants. And they did this because they saw that increases in allo were seen in doses that were 10 times lower than concentrations that affected 5-HT activity. And psychiatric symptoms were improving at this dose, which is way below the threshold for serotonin activity. It's also known that allopregnanolone is a allosteric modulator of the GABA-A receptor. In fact, it's a positive allosteric modulator. So what does that mean? So here's the GABA-A receptor here, and you can see all these different subunits on there. And so benzodiazepines, they are the anti-anxiety drugs, are also a positive allosteric modulator of this GABA-A receptor. And so what that means is that they're not directly causing this channel to open, when an agonist or when a molecule that opens these channels binds, it's making it more efficient and increasing the intensity of the chlorine currents. And so it potentiates the intensity of these GABA-gated chlorine currents, which is basically making the GABA-A receptor more functional. And there's multiple parts of the brain that express the enzymes that help create allopregnanolone, and I'll talk about that later in this presentation. But SSRIs, fluoxetine, Prozac, which is trade name Prozac, and paroxetine, which is trade name Paxil, failed to increase progesterone or pregnenolone. So if you look here at this, this is how allopregnenolone is, is produced in the body, and in the brain in particular for our case. And you can see that these levels aren't changing. Well, this level is increasing. And how is that possible? And they also saw that Fluoxetine and paroxetine activate 3-alpha-HSD, this enzyme right here, which decreases its CAM for when you're taking 5-alpha uh, dehydroprogesterone and turning it into allopregnolone. So how does decreasing something increase the activity of this enzyme? Well, you have to understand what KM is. KM is the substrate concentration at which the reaction is half of Vmax, or half of its maximum speed. So if you have a lower KM, just imagine this curve being steeper, which means that you're getting to this maximum Vmax quicker, which means that the, the enzyme is working more efficiently. Whereas if you had a KM that was a much, much larger number, you'd have a lot longer to get to that Vmax value. You need a lot more concentration of substrate to get to that value. So when you have a lower KM, it's being more efficient. And so when they say that the KM is decreased for this reaction, um, right here from 5-alpha uh, dehydroprogesterone to allopregnanolone, that means that it's being made more efficient. So here it is right here. So SSRIs decrease this CAM by 10 to 30 times with the DHP substrate. And this is where we have to get a little bit more complex. So when you're going with this DHP or this dehydroprogesterone, which we've been talking about as 5-alpha dehydroprogesterone, just labeled differently in this this image right here, and it's going to allopregnanolone, this CAM is decreasing, and the Vmax, actually we talked about Vmax, Vmax is actually doubling. So not only are you decreasing CAM, but you're doubling Vmax. But when you're going from allopregnanolone backwards, there's, there's no change in SSRI, and that's interesting, especially because the tricyclic antidepressant are not changing the Vmax or the CAM of these reactions. So what this does is it pushes more into allopregnanolone, but it's complicated. So aldoketoreductase, or AKR, these are a family of proteins, and they are NADPH dependent. And what does that mean? Well, here's a AKR, aldose reductase, and here's NADPH. And this molecule undergoes a redox reaction to NADP+. And the same thing, you'll also be talking about, about NADH, which is very similar besides missing a phosphate group. 
That's why this is being called NADPH, because it also has this phosphate group. NADH is lacking that phosphate group. But what is a redox reaction? You may not have taken chemistry, it may have been a while ago. A redox reaction is a transfer of electrons. So it's a change in oxidation number. A reduction is when you gain electrons and the oxidation number decreases. And an oxidation is when you lose electrons and the oxidation number increases. An easy way to remember this is oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Oil rig. So it's a, kind of a easy way to maybe get in your head what oxidation and reduction are in terms of electrons. So oxidation being the loss of electrons and reduction being the gain of electrons. Here are two redox reactions we can go over how they work. An oxidation reaction, you're having these two hydrogen molecules and you're losing these two electrons, so oxidation is loss, hence oxidation reaction. Where in this reduction reaction, when you have the product, you're actually gonna be gaining electrons, so reduction is gain, so that's a reduction step. So besides confusing you quite a bit, when I looked at these, aldohyde reductases earlier. The goal was to show that there are many different ways that the body can use signaling to control a step. And so while one part of the body might be using these alpha keto reductases, another part of the body could be using something totally different. And all that might be different between them is using NADPH versus NADH. And so now we're going to go back into and look a little bit how the body uses something like this in order to differentiate between two different reactions. So it gets a little more tricky than this because subsequent studies have looked at this and said, hey, wait a minute, this right here, this 5 alpha reductase, this part of it from progesterone to DHP before you even go to allopredinalone is the rate limiting step. This is what's holding up the reaction. And because they've seen that progesterone and DHP levels aren't changing during treatment, although allopregnalone levels are, they were confused as to why increasing the activity of this right here is AKR. And I said before that these AKR, these alpha keto reductases, they are the ones that are using this NADPH. <clears throat> and so that's different here than this retinal dehydrogenase, which is using NADPH. H and turning it to NAD+, and this retinal dehydrogenase is being hypothesized then is possibly being inhibited as a form of stopping allopredinone from turning back into DHP because they argue that NADPH here and here, these, these are using a similar method of action, and they claim that because this is a rate limiting step, that increasing this by a lot wouldn't increase allopredinone enough. Also, I talked about studies that showed that in going in this direction, there is an increase in efficiency with an SSRI, but also there have been studies that show no increase or a very limited increase. But while this is a, is a nice theory, there have been studies that show that going in this direction is not really affected by an SSRI treatment. So we're kind of locked in a place where we have a lot of puzzle pieces, but we don't have a set theory. And what all that is really known is that allopredinone levels are changing in SSRI treatment, even in very, very low concentrations. There have been many hypotheses brought up, and it's kind of a testament to the process of science that we don't currently understand what's happening in these pathways. These are the sources that I used in this video. If you like this video, I'd check out the ones I did in the last few weeks, and please subscribe to my channel as well. Thanks.